And continuing with Johnny Tremaine by Esther Forbes and illustrated by Lind Ward. And that's at all the chapter breaks. We have great illustrations. And we're going to be reading section three here. But section two, just to remind you, was uh, that Scylla actually stopped by um, the Boston Observer office. And Johnny was out doing his errands, but she ends up talking to Rab. And <clears throat> it's really kind of uh, funny how she and Rab are just having a lovely time chatting with each other. And she looks really pretty. And Johnny is like taken aback and kind of shocked about how pretty she does look. And then he's jealous of the way Scylla and Rab are talking and laughing. And then Rab walks her home and he seems like he's really um, happy when he comes back. Uh, and so Johnny says, you can tell he had a good time. Now, another really important piece of information here is that Miss Lavinia, the, the Light family had been ordering some silver, like regularly, from the Laphams. And you know it's just to spite Johnny, but Miss Lavinia had gone over and had seen Isana, and she saw how beautiful she was, and and... Uh, Johnny says, what, what was she doing? Throwing up? Because he thinks of her as being that sickly child. And Scylla says, no, I had just washed her hair. And so basically, Miss Lavinia, this rich girl, says, I, I want this child. I want her. And she, she basically worked out a deal with Mrs. Lapham so that Miss Lavinia could take the two girls and just have them as playmates, like little sisters. And so it just kind of speaks to how lonely Miss Lavinia is, but also how money and power kind of works its way into uh, the daily routine. And then Mrs. Lapham has to like lose her two younger daughters to this rich family because they can do a better job, quote, uh, raising the daughters and affording them and feeding them and giving them nice clothing. And so, of course, the girls are like, woohoo, you know, we get all these nice things, but you lose the love of your family. So that's really sad. Anyhow, we move on into section three. Now, the only regularity in Johnny's life was the great effort he made to see Scylla every Thursday and the care he gave to Goblin. But when he went to the Afric Queen, he was going into enemy territory. The tavern had been taken over bodily by British officers, chief among whom was Colonel Francis Smith. Goblin was the only horse in the stable that did not belong to a British officer, for the landlord had sent his to the country, fearing they would either be commandeered by the occupying troops or that he could not get hay for them. About the stables, British orderlies, officers, servants, and small British horse boys, the servants of the servants, were always congregating. Johnny paid little heed to them. They all knew that he rode for the observer, but they also knew that he often rode for their own officers. Sometimes they picked on him, and once when things got too bad and he felt he had to fight it out with the worst bully, the other boys, all his enemies, stood about demanding fair play, saying, well fought, Yankee, and that's neat, when he beat the bully. He had rather thought the whole gang would be on him the second he got the bully down, but instead they merely respected him. So he made out better than he could have expected, until one day he found that Colonel Smith had a new horse boy. The one he had brought over with him had run away. So he had told his orderly officer to find a new one, and that boy was Dove. <gasps> bum, bum, bum. Johnny saw him grinning sheepishly at him, hoping they might be friends. They, the only two local boys at the stable. You, Johnny muttered out of the corner of his mouth. You trash, you milk pudding, you cottage cheese slug. 
So you're not above going to work for them, are you? Honest, Johnny, I got her eat. Old Tweety fired me. An orderly stuck his head in the stable. Boy, he said to Johnny, Colonel Smith has a letter to go to Milton. Please go to the parlor and see him or Lieutenant Stranger about it. A slow, gap-toothed grin spread over Dove's face. Looks like you work for them, too. Looks like, said Johnny fiercely. He saw the colonel, went home for his boots and spurs, then took out Goblin and saddled him. One of the English boys had got Dove down and was twisting his arm, making him swear allegiance to his Britannic Majesty, gracious George the Third. Dove was swearing fast enough and protesting that that was the way he really felt. All rebels should be hung. Johnny had a queer feeling at the pit of his stomach. He wanted to go to his rescue. He had to make himself remember that he hated Dove. What? Change of Johnny's character? What in this paragraph? But that fellow over there, Dove was pointing to Johnny, is really on the other side, and Johnny left Dove to his fate. It was a crisp, fresh day for summer, the first respite after a week of unendurable heat. Goblin felt fine. He came sidling out of the stable, dancing and playing. Johnny let him move about, get the kinks out of him. He loved the horse. He loved the admiration he saw on every face, grooms dropping curry combs, officers looking out of windows and talking to each other and nodding toward Goblin. Chambermaids, rich Tory gentlemen, all stopped to stare when Goblin played. Although he mostly kept his eyes on Goblin's wickedly flattened ears, it's the only way you can tell which way a horse will jump next, he did notice a thick red face at the parlor window, Colonel Smith, and he heard his booming voice. Boy, one moment. Doubtless he had changed his mind about that letter for Milton. Lieutenant Stranger his orderly officer, was coming out of the parlor. He had on no hat. His spurs were in his hand. He was a dark young fellow, not much older than Rab, and something in both his color and carriage had always made Johnny think of Rab. That's quite a horse you have there. He's all right. Well, we sort of hate to see a damned Yankee on top of a good horse like that. How much will you take? He belongs to my master, Mr. Lorne. Colonel Smith, he called to the stiff, red face at the window. This horse belongs to Lorne, the printer. Boston Observer, you know. We can commandeer him all right. You fix the proper price. So, boy, how much will your master take for him? He's not for sale. Oh, he isn't, is he? You know damned little about the rights of His Majesty's armed forces. You get off and I'll try him around the block and see how I think he would suit Colonel Smith. He knelt and buckled him on his spurs. The handsome black washerwoman of the inn, Lydia, came out carrying a hamper of wet clothes. Johnny had an idea. All right, Lieutenant Stranger, he said politely. Put the stirrups down a couple of notches. Now, hand me my gloves. I'll be back in ten minutes. Goblin was watching out of the corner of his crystalline blue eyes. Not for months had anyone but Johnny Tremaine been on his back. But the lieutenant mounted confidently, picked up the reins, and held them exactly as Goblin liked. The horse moved quietly out of the inn yard. Colonel Smith's face disappeared from the parlor window. Lydia, said Johnny, as he strolled over to the washerwoman, I'll help you with those clothes. Now think, think about Goblin. She gave him a dazzling smile. My land, Johnny boy, I could do with a bit of help. Them Britishers expect a clean sheet every week and seems like a clean shirt every day. Johnny gravely pinned a couple of shirts on the line, his mouth, like Lydia's, full of wooden clothespins. The ruffled shirts began to snap smartly in the breeze. <laughs> Sheets? 
We've got 17 officers staying with us. We've got sheets by the dozen. Look, Lydia, you lend me a sheet for just a few moments. If I get it dirty, I'll wash it. And besides, I'll hang up every sheet in your basket. Boy, I don't know what you're up to, and I suspect no good. You'll do as I say. If it's that Lieutenant Stranger what's took your horse away from you, I'll do plenty. He wants to commandeer Goblin for his colonel. We, I don't, don't know commandeer, but sure sounds dreadful cruel to me. It is a way you cook things, Johnny, said Johnny soberly. Well, that's not what commandeer means, but he's saying something to make it sound very, very bad. My land, boy, don't you let them cook that pretty horse of yours. Huh, I'll cook them first. Now look, we've got to stand fairly near to the driveway, like this. You get on that end of the sheet, and I on this, and we'll let her fill up with wind. Wait, he's coming back. So now, let go, Lydia, let go. Quick, let go. The sheet bellied out like a sail when Lydia let go. Goblin, quickly recognizing Stranger's skill and goodwill, had behaved admirably. The lieutenant thought he'd advise his colonel to pay a pretty fancy price for such a choice beast. Colonel Smith, a timid horseman, liked showy mounts. This one was showy all right, with his strange pale coat and mane and tail like mahogany. He was young and high-strung. Stringer believed he himself would have to ride him for the next month to get him gentle enough for his superior. But his gates were like dancing. Let me see, he was thinking. I'll offer Lauren. And then the whole earth blew up from under him and hit him a terrific blow on his seat. There was a splash as well. He had landed in a mud puddle. Now what that means is the horse reared up and threw him off. The horse was disappearing into the stable. He, he got up ruefully, this is the man who was riding, ruefully looked at his white breeches, shrugged, and walked over to where Johnny was diligently pinning up sheets. Both he and Lydia had their backs discreetly turned so they were not watching, but they knew what the horse would do. Well, he said to Johnny belligerently, Yes, sir. I'd already noticed your horse worries a bit over blown paper in the streets. Things like that. I suppose you know that, too? Yes, sir. Take those damn clothespins out of your mouth and turn around and answer me. Once the clothespins were out of his mouth, it was hard not to laugh. Answer you what, sir? You flapped that sheet on purpose just for the fun of seeing me sit in a puddle and... <laughs> and to keep my horse out of the army. Oh, you, said Stranger, pretending to be angry, but Johnny knew that at heart he was not. Colonel Smith's great red face once more appeared. Howdy ride, Lieutenant. Gad, sir, what? Where's the horse, sir? What have you been mucking about in? Mud puddles, sir, I fell off. He made no excuse to excuse himself. Beast vicious, eh? No, sir, just a mite jumpy. No good for army work, nor even just hacking about Boston. But that damned boy, how does he manage? It's his horse, sir. Thanks, Lieutenant. You can look elsewhere for me. The head went in. Stringer was stretching himself lightly. I'll drink my beer standing up for a few days. He said to no one in particular. That means he can't sit down because his backside is so sore from being thrown off the horse. Then, as an afterthought, beer. Hi, kitchen, he yelled in the arrogant way Johnny noticed the young officers always called for service. Two tankards of beer out here in the yard. He turned to Johnny. What's your horse's name? Goblin. We'll drink to Goblin. Pot boy, give that tankard to this young man. You know, of course, there's no real cure for a horse that shies as badly as that. I've been told he'll never be gentle. If he was as good as he looks, I'd hate to guess what he'd be worth. As it is, I'd not give fifteen shillings for him. Except, and he smiled suddenly, 
for myself to ride. Have you schooled him in jumping? No, we're not fancy riders over here. At the foot of the common, you'll find a series of hurdles we've put up. If happens you're over there sometime when I am, I'll show you a bit. Thank you, sir. Does he still throw you sometimes? <laughs> sometimes. I'd have gone off fast enough when that sheet let loose. Ha! <laughs> that sheet! Ha! <laughs> ha! That was a trick. That was good. That was fine. Hi, you black wench. You fetch, finish this beer for me and take the tankards back to the kitchen. And off he stalked, still chuckling to himself. Very kind of disrespectful speak, of course. You'd never say that now. But he, the point of this is that he respects Johnny more for keeping Goblin from him by an honest trick. He just basically showed him how jumpy Goblin is when around uh, loose papers, sheets, flapping clothing in the wind. So they totally did that on purpose. It was awesome. Beginning with that day when Goblin had tumbled Lieutenant Stringer in the mud, Johnny had no more trouble with the British stable boys. When it became hard for him to get the oats and hay for Goblin, they told him he might use theirs. That means he can use theirs if, if he wishes. But Dove, who was always swearing allegiance to England, and Johnny knew that he honestly was a Tory, was the butt of all their jokes. Dove clung to Johnny like a drowning man, and Johnny did protect him. What? Again, Johnny is protecting Dove. He could not help himself, so Dove began oozing into his life oh, like a thick mud. He spent most of his free time at the observer's office and was always complaining, always gorging himself on the scarce food and bored both Johnny and Rab. But Rab said, and Johnny knew this was true, sometime the British would not stay tamely shut up in Boston. Sometime they'd strike out and seize the military supplies they knew the provincials were collecting. A colonel's horse boy might very well know a day or so, even or even a few hours before a colonel marched. It was up to Johnny to keep in touch with Dove. It was all right for Rab to talk. Rab was training with the armed forces. But what could Johnny do? Not much, it seemed to him, except be bored to death for his country. End of section three and end of this video. Click subscribe and come back and see what happens.